get this going. So before we get into content, anybody have any open questions? Any questions about project stuff? Talk about web sockets. So uh, I'll get the homework six doc up as soon as I can. Um, I'll drive them up Monday before the time after the homework starts. Uh, but you can count on homework six being a lot like homework five, just with web sockets instead of AJAX requests. So we want to get real time communication between users using the web socket <coughs> protocol. That's our goal for homework six. So functionality wise, a lot of the same as homework five, except we won't have the polling delays, and we're going to use WebSockets, which are uh, a bit more work to implement. We're going to see uh, uh, see that it's a little bit involved to implement the WebSocket protocol. So let's talk about that, and that's why it's a whole week and not, not just one lecture for this. So let's talk about it and get an introduction into what WebSockets even are. Oops. <laughs> this slide was not supposed to make the cut. Uh, and get an idea of what these even are. So no questions before we get into it? One more chance. Let's do it. All right, so with Ajax, we had, uh, just to summarize, we had a server listening for Ajax requests. The server handled those just as regular HTTP requests. And the browser would send these uh, re Ajax requests after the page loaded without reloading the page again. So if the user wanted to send information to the server or get information from the server, they would send AJAX requests. And then we used polling and long polling to be able to get that information without the user having to take any action. So we set up our polling. If you had the poll make that AJAX request every second, you get that information with up to a one second delay. You could, um, and then there was this trade off. We could lower the delay between the polls but that's going to cause a lot more network traffic, a lot more load on the server and the client. Um, or we can lengthen the polls, lessen the load, but increase the delay and harm the user experience uh, on that side. We talked about long polling, but we didn't implement it. Long polling can be a bit tricky to implement at times. Uh, so we could go that route and get rid of that delay and get rid of the issues with polling, but we're gonna take it in another direction and talk about web sockets to resolve that issue instead of coding up long polling. <clears throat> so we had a few drawbacks, unless we implement the whole uh, long polling. Let's talk about WebSockets and how this is going to get rid of those issues. So with WebSockets, we have full, what we call full duplex communication, or full two-way communication between the client and server. Once the WebSocket connection is established, we get what we call server pushes. The server can just send information to the client completely unprompted. And this is the big feature that we want with our WebSockets. Instead of having to sit there and wait for a pull request, with this WebSocket connection, the server's just gonna say, hey, client, I have information for you. Here it is, and send that message uh, to the client. That's something we can't get with HTTP. HTTP is this request, request response protocol. WebSockets is two-way communication. It does, we don't have to wait for a request to be able to respond with a response and information, we're going to be able to send information to our users whenever we want. Yes? So the client can also send messages whenever they want. I, I just didn't highlight that as much because they can always do that with HTTP with AJAX requests, but this, uh, the client can also send messages over the website. So the client's sending messages whenever it wants, the server's sending connections. Uh, messages whenever it wants. Yeah, the, the server part is the big new feature that we get. That's the juicy part that we're interested in. Uh, that said, the client, we're going to send messages from the client as well, of course, but, uh, um, but yeah, we had that with HTTP. So, how does this work? Would work surprisingly similar to HTTP. Uh, we're going to establish a TCP connection just like we did with HTTP. We're actually going to send, the client's going to send an HTTP request, obviously just like HTTP. So, so far, those first two bullet points, this is just an H, a regular HTTP request. 
After that, that's where it starts to change up. The actual request, the HTTP request, is going to be a request to switch protocols to the WebSocket protocol. Once we get this HTTP request which says, let's, uh, let's use WebSockets, if the server supports WebSockets, it's going to respond uh, with that uh, confirmation, yes, let's use WebSockets. And then we're going to keep that TCP socket open that was, uh, that was used to make that HTTP request. We're going to keep that TCP socket open and use that socket to be able to communicate both ways. So TCP sockets are naturally two-way communication. This is everything that we need from web sockets. But we, with HTTP, we make a TCP connection, the, the client sends a request, we send a response, and then that connection can be closed, usually it's left open, uh, that keep alive, if you've seen that in the headers. Usually we use that to be able to use that same socket for more request responses, uh, but it's not necessary. That TCP connection is established, HTTP request, HTTP response, we can close the connection after that. Uh, there's no, even if it is reused, there's no memory of the previous request and response. There's no real established connection between those. What WebSocket says is, hey, let's keep that TCP connection open. We already did this TCP three-way handshake. We established this connection and everything. Let's just leave that open and just keep sending messages back and forth over the socket. Instead of just request response, let's just have full duplex communication over that TCP socket that we already have. We already have that connection. Let's just keep using it. And that's the, the base idea of WebSockets. Keep that TCP connection open. Uh, this has advantages even over polling or long uh, polling, of course, but even over long polling. Each long poll, you have to do another TCP handshake if that is a concern, I suppose. Uh, you have to do that TCP handshake to establish a TCP connection for every single long pull. With WebSockets, you only have one TCP connection, one TCP handshake, and you leave that connection open. And that's just the messages going back and forth uh, for each connection. Especially when we start talking about encryption, that can be more helpful if every long pull request we're doing a TCP three-way handshake, doing a key exchange, figuring out our symmetric key to be able to encrypt our communication and then sending an encrypted long pull, hey, do you have anything for me? 15 seconds later, now nah, I got nothing. It, it's kind of a waste, it's a bit of overhead. With WebSockets, TCP handshake, key exchange, let's start encrypting everything, and then after that it's just messages back and forth on the same connection. Then once we have that connection over uh, established, it's sending WebSocket messages, which we call frames, the protocol calls them frames. We're going to send WebSocket messages back and forth. We're not going to talk about this last part too much today, but we'll talk about establishing the connection and, and how to get that TCP, TCP connection to stay, uh, staying open in a way that the client and server are both agreeing on how that's going to happen. Uh, and then Wednesday, we'll start parsing the actual, actual messages which, uh, which gets decently involved. There's a decent amount of stuff to talk about in there. It's not as easy as just reading bytes uh, or reading headers and then uh, reading the body. There's a little bit more to it, and you'll see when we get there. I'll talk about this, uh, I'll overview this today, and we'll talk about it in detail on Wednesday. So to keep this uh, connection open, we have to agree on how that's going to happen, and we have to have this handshake. Handshakes, uh, you know, we use this uh, this term a bit. We uh, we briefly talked about it with TCP. I think it was just one slide I flashed, and then then it was over. Um, but a handshake, whenever we're establishing a connection between um, between two entities over the network, we have some handshake to be able to determine: Are we speaking the right protocols? How, you know, how is the communication going to happen? Just agreeing on some, kind of some of the meta information and just uh, doing a little bit of verification to make sure that this connection is going to be valid and we're going to be able to effectively communicate. So let's talk about the WebSocket handshake and how this, uh, how this handshake works. So at a very high level, I guess there's not too many more details with the request, but at a high level, this is how it's going to, uh, how the handshake 
is going to go down. It's an HTTP request. The, the client is going to send an HTTP GET request to some WebSocket path, which is whatever path you chose on your server to be able to establish the WebSocket connection. So any path that you choose, slash socket is a good, is a fine a choice as any, but some path that your server is listening to where you're expecting WebSocket connections. So make a request, an HTTP request to that path and add these very specific headers. Connection upgrade, I wanna upgrade this connection, I wanna upgrade it to WebSockets, and then some random key, the secure WebSocket key. With these three headers, as long as our path is, is coded to listen for, uh, for WebSocket connections, it's these three headers that the client's going to send to say, let's use WebSockets. I'm done with HTTP, I want to create a WebSocket connection. Your server is going to respond with a 101 response. We haven't seen any 100 level response codes yet, but it's a 101 for the switching protocols. Meaning we're going to keep this TCP connection open, but we're going to switch the protocol away from HTTP, and we're going to start using WebSockets. I'm going to send back, you're going to send back those two, uh, headers upgrade to WebSockets and some secure WebSocket accept response. Once the client gets this, it says, all right, this is a WebSocket connection now. This is what we're going to use this TCP connection for is WebSockets. We're not using this one for HTTP anymore. And then client and server are both going to keep that alive. The, so the, Key, I left the details out of the key and the accept. Because it's uh, a little strange at first. We'll explain why, why this is. Uh, oh, right there on that bullet point. Uh, but this will be a little strange at first. But there's a very, very specific thing that has to happen with these two headers. So that, that key header that the client is going to send, that's just going to be some random string. And the client's going to generate that randomly with every WebSocket connection. Every WebSocket HTTP request to upgrade to WebSockets is going to have a different randomly generated key attached to it. The client is going to get that key and append this very specific string to it. It has to be exactly that string. Don't ask me why that one specifically. I'm sure there's some reason. No, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Um, but this exact string, anybody, any server implementing the WebSocket protocol is using this exact string. If you're using a WebSocket library for your project, somewhere in that library, this string is going to be in there. Uh, probably just hard coded, sitting in a constant somewhere. Uh, is going to be this exact string. It is part of the protocol. That exact string has a lot of meaning in the world of WebSockets. So the server, to be able to upgrade to WebSockets, is going to read the key, the client's key, append this exact string to the end of that key. Uh, remember, this is a header, so everything's text, and, and all these things are tr communicated in headers. So all this is ASCII, has to be ASCII characters, ASCII text. So I'm gonna take this ASCII key, Append this ASCII string to the end of it. Compute the SHA-1 hash. And this is one case, uh, you can pull in libraries to do the hashing for you. I, I don't expect you to write a hashing, uh, implement SHA-1. Um, compute the SHA-1 hash of that. And then base64 encode that. And that's what you send back as the accept. All these steps have to happen exactly because that's exactly what the client is going to expect. The client is expecting this accept to be exactly their random key with this appended to the end, take the SHA-1 hash of that, and then base64 encode it. If the client doesn't see exactly that string in the accept header, it's not going to upgrade to WebSockets. Question? Why is that? Yeah, it is. 
I, I don't know why that string. I, I just don't know. I, I don't know if there's a good story behind it or not, um, but the protocol defines this exact string, uh, so that's the one we use. If anybody finds a good story and knows why that exact string, I'd like to hear it. Um, but I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. How do we tell the client what header to send? Like, up till now, the browser is deciding to send. How do we set those to register? Uh, so, this is all defined in the WebSocket protocol. So, if the client wants to establish a WebSocket connection, those are the exact headers. Like these three headers, exactly, like those have to be sent, and that key is going to be some random string that they generate. So, how do you, how do you tell the client which header to do a website? It'll be in your JavaScript code. Okay. Uh, and, and we'll see that it's uh, the last few slides that I had. JavaScript, the client side, uh, we're not going to mess with that too much. Client side JavaScript is just going to do that for us. We're actually going to say new WebSocket and then the path, and it'll know to send its headers. So we're not going to have to worry about that client side. But server side, that's where we're going to have to parse these headers and, and figure out what to send back. So if this except is exactly these procedures, the SHA-1 hash, the base64. Uh, base64 encoding, we'll, maybe we'll talk about this uh, in a little more detail on, uh, on Wednesday. But a quick summary, base64 encoding, remember when we had our images, if you convert that to a string, you lose a lot of information because those bytes don't convert to, uh, to UTF-8 characters. They're not following the proper encoding. Base64 is, uh, is addressing that issue. If you have bytes, and you want to send it as a string, uh, the SHA-1 hash, that's going to return, um, return hex to us. If we want to represent that as a string, we can use a different encoding, base64, which is going to just take that raw information, encode it as a string, and then we can send it, uh, and then we can send it as a string after that. The base64 has, uh, has a mapping of bytes to ASCII characters. I believe it stays in ASCII. I don't think it ventures into UTF-8 uh, territory. I think it stays in that ASCII territory. Um, but it's to be able to represent bytes as a string without losing the encoding, without trying to decode and not having proper encoding. All right, so why did we do all this? This. Uh, just to make sure, a big part is just to make sure that everybody is speaking the right, uh, speaking the right protocol. The protocol has a very specific definition. This is what we do, this is what the protocol says. If, uh, if either side isn't doing this, if the client isn't sending this key header, and if the server isn't computing this exact thing, uh, then there's no guarantee that each side is actually talking WebSockets. In fact, they're not. The server isn't talking WebSockets if it doesn't send back this specific thing. Uh, and this is something that would not happen by accident. It's extremely low probability that this value that's sent back is just going to be, happen by mistake. So we don't want a client accidentally making a WebSocket connection to a server that doesn't speak WebSockets. And that's just not going to happen with this, uh, with this protocol. The client's going to get some garbage back, might not even have the right headers, and the client can say, okay, this server doesn't support WebSockets on this path. Let me try something else to be able to connect. Um, and uh, and we wanna, the reason why the key is random, we want to avoid caching, and this will come up a few times in, in WebSockets. The servers can get pretty aggressive with caching. Even when we control the server, we might have some libraries, we might pull in load balancers and things like that. Uh, they can get pretty aggressive with caching. They want to optimize everything, uh, which is a good thing, of course. Uh, but in this case, if we were trying to, say, keep this TCP connection open so we can speak WebSockets over it, you don't want a load balancer to say, oh, I already have this in cache. Let me just send the client this cached response and never forward that to our actual server because then we have no TCP connection that we're keeping open. 
So we definitely don't want this thing being cached, and the client sending a random key each time is going to avoid that caching. It's going to say, oh, well, this request looks a bit different. Let me actually send this over to the server. So once we have a connection established, this is what we'll talk about on, on Wednesday in detail, but, uh, but let's get at least an overview here. But once the uh, connection is established and we're saying we're going to keep this TCP, uh, TCP connection open, uh, we're going to keep this TCP connection open, now we can actually have this two-way communication that we're after. And the, the Messages that we send back and forth, they're going to be, uh, like I said, we're going to call them frames. And we're going to work at the bit level here. So if you thought bytes were fun, just wait. I'm actually excited about this. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how many of you will share my, my excitement here. Uh, but in computer science, we learn about bits. Like in one, uh, the curriculum shifted a bit. So I might, might misspeak a little bit here. But in 191, uh, you learn about bits and binary operations uh, and uh, XORs and, and all that fun stuff. In 341, you learn quite a bit more about that. In 220, which most of you haven't had to take, but in 220, you learn a lot of um, uh, more things at the bit level. But then we don't have really applications of it. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's just me. I haven't really found many applications where I actually have to care that a computer is in bits. Because you always hear this, computers all just ones and zeros, everything is just ones and zeros. Um, but at most, we go down to the byte level, which I guess is ones and zeros, uh, but we work at the hex level. Here's an application where we're actually going to be looking at the bits. We're going to be using bit mass and actually looking at each individual one or zero to be able to get our information from these frames. So there's a, a lot of knowledge that we teach you, but then there's no real application, there's no real reason to know it. But here's one reason, WebSockets, we're gonna talk about bits in detail on Wednesday. Uh, but just as an overview, here's the format of a WebSocket frame, where each one of these uh, is one bit. So this is one bit, one bit, one bit, four bits, one bit, seven bits, uh, 16 or 64 bits. Uh, and we got to parse through this to get the actual information that we need. I'll give a quick uh, high-level overview of it. Is uh, the fin bit, is this the end, is this the last frame of a message? Which is usually one, unless you have re really large messages. Reserve bits, we don't use these. Oh, embarrassing, I'm gonna blank off the top of my head. Opcode. I mean, it's the operation code. Uh, it, it's almost always a specific for bits saying we get a message, but I'm actually blanking on what all the opcodes are right now. Uh, so I'll just skip over that one. The mask bit, uh, this is one if we're using a mask and zero if we're not using a mask. And we'll see that when the client sends us a frame that it's going to be set to one, the client's always going to use a bit mask, or not a bit mask, but a, a mask a four byte mass, and when we send responses, we don't have to use the mass, we're gonna set that to zero when we send responses to the client. The payload length is the number of, uh, the number of, uh, uh, I'm hesitant just a little bit here, the number of bytes, I'm pretty sure, in the message, not the number of bits. Uh, but I'll give you a 100% answer. On Wednesday, of course, when I'm, uh, I have all this loaded in my RAM. Uh, but the, pay, the length of the message, and if the message can't fit in seven bits, we're going to have an extended payload length. If we need more space to be able to specify how large this payload is, we're going to use a larger payload length, depending on the value of this. If this value is either 126 or 127, then we have an extended length, either 16-bit length or 64-bit length if we have a really long message. Uh, then the mask key and all the payload. So if there is a mask, we're going to take this four byte 
mask and XOR that with every four bytes of the payload to be able to demask the payload and be able to actually read our message in bytes and then we can decode it, ASCII uh, or whatever uh, is actually being sent, uh, whatever encoding is being used. The mask I want to talk about a little bit, when the client is sending messages to us, it's always going to use a mask, which is these four bytes, and then every four bytes of the message is XOR with that mask. So if we just take the message and try to decode it, it's not going to work because it's XOR with this mask. We have to demask this to be able to get the information. And again, this is all for caching. If the client is sending the same message multiple times, that server might get a little aggressive on the caching. It might just send back the response that we sent last time without actually getting that information to the server. But of course we want this information. If this is a chat app, the server needs that chat, needs to store that in the database, needs to share that with other users. It's not concerned with the client getting our, you know, whatever message we would send back, which would be nothing for a WebSocket. We don't have to send a response to every message of a WebSocket. We just have this two-way communication, we're receiving information. So it doesn't make sense for this to be cached. With the mask, even if you send the same message a thousand times, it's going to be completely different each time. It's going to look different. It's going to confuse the cachers, which we want in this case, and those messages are always going to be forwarded to our server if we have a load balancer or anything else um, uh, for optimization in our app. And again, we'll talk about that in more depth. Uh, in more depth next time. No. Try and do something. I, I won't be able to do that in time. Do it later. Uh, all right. So, so let's talk about what this looks like in the browser. And then I'll go to some code and we'll see a few examples of making these connections. So in the browser, this is how we're going to set up TCP, send messages and receive messages, or TCP, uh, WebSockets. So uh, we're going to use this WebSocket object, which is going to do pretty much all of the work for its client side. Uh, kind of a theme of this course, we're not too concerned about what's going on client side. We're just going to get stuff done client side. We're going to focus on our web servers and how to get the functionality in our server. So this WebSocket object, create a new WebSocket connection using the WebSocket protocol. Get the host. I'm just using whatever host was uh, made the initial connection. By the way, if you leave this blank, it'll default to the host in half that made the initial connection. It doesn't sound right when I say it. Anyway, it won't use your path that you're expecting. Um, so we're going to specify the host. I'm going to use just whatever host it was. Um, I've seen this in some homeworks. Don't code, hard code anything as local host. We always want to get whatever host this is. So when we deploy out there in the world, uh, that's the actual host that we're, um, that we're hosting on. If we use window location host, that's going to get that exact host. And then the path that we want to connect to. So we're specifying establish a connection with the host that you're connected to, wherever you got the HTML from. And then whatever path you choose, slash socket is as good as any, but any path that you choose where your server is going to listen for get requests at that path and expect WebSocket connections and respond, you know, look for the key. Uh, append hash base64 and code and respond with that in a header. Wherever that logic is happening on your server, that's the path you have to add here. Make sure that that is syncing up. When we want to handle messages, we're going to set the sockets on message field to some function that's going to be called every time we receive a message from the server. So every time we get a message from the server, we're going to call render messages with the content of that message. And here I'm just printing it to the screen. I'm not doing anything fancy here. Um, but that's whatever code we need to be able to handle a message every time we receive information from the server. And the client is going to handle all the 
uh, parsing through the frame, handling the bits and everything for us. We'll do that server side. We're not concerned with doing it twice uh, or doing it in JavaScript, which would be pretty painful, uh, depending on your, your opinion on JavaScript, I suppose. But here, I'm just going to log that message and do message.data, get the content of that message. And again, I'm just printing it to the screen here, but this is where you would, uh, if this is a chat app, append that message to the end of your chat history. And finally, if I want to send a message, I'm going to do socket.send and give it a string. And again, the client is going to do the work to build the frame for us. It's going to generate a random mask. It's going to XOR that mask with every four bytes of the message. It's going to set the length of the message. Uh, it's going to do all that for us. We just have to do socket.send, give it a string, done. So client side, we're not gonna we're not gonna do too much work here. We're offloading everything to this WebSocket object. And then the client, uh, the server side, that's where we're going to do all of the work. Yep. Yeah. So if you if you take four bytes and XOR it with some random four bytes and then XOR it with those same bytes again, you're back to your original message. So the client's XORing every four bytes, and then we're XORing every four bytes with that same mass, so we get back to the original message. And we'll see examples. We'll go down to the bit level and see a bunch of ones and zeros on Wednesday. Because that mask is random each time, and that's what's going to avoid the caching. Yeah, if that mask was the same every time, there would be completely no purpose. But since the mask is randomly generated every time we call send, that's what's going to get us the functionality we need to basically remove a feature from our load balancers. So it's kind of silly, but uh, um, but if we get cached on any of this, you know, it's not going to work the way we want it to. So let's see an example of this on Twitch. Uh, for the sake of example, let's, uh, let's refresh. Network error occurred anyway. I mean, we're not concerned with that, but. All right, so I'm gonna refresh on whatever stream was the, the first one on the home page when I open this. And let's take a look at the, the uh, HTTP requests we got. We scroll through all these, and we we'll look for one specific one. Apparently we get two of them, but I want the chat one. And uh, Twitch chat does use WebSockets, that's why I'm using this example. So Twitch chat using WebSockets, let's take a look at how this is implemented. So I'm gonna go to the request that got a 101 switching protocols response and open up this uh, and open up this request. And we can see everything's working the way we should. We should be able to see those headers that we expect. So the request, we're going to request WSS, uh, the secure version of WebSockets. You're not going to see WS out in the wild. Uh, and we'll talk about security. We'll get our encryption on when we get back from spring break. Um, but we're going to send a WebSocket request. I want to use the WebSocket protocol to um, to this host. We're going to see connection upgrade, upgrade WebSocket, and WebSocket key. We're going to see at the very least those three uh, those three headers. They have to be there. The WebSocket key is just some random garbage, but very important random garbage. And then on the response, we got these three, re, uh, these three headers on the response, connection upgrade, upgrade to WebSockets. And no, that wasn't a typo with the, the capitalization. For some reason, that's the capitalization. WebSockets all lower, upgrade starts with a capital U. I don't know why somebody decided that's the, the way it should be. And then WebSocket accept is this very specific, very calculated value 
to be able to get this, uh, this protocol off the ground. So let's take a look at how that value was generated. Do this in the code. Actually, I'll have time to show it in the code in, the, in Scala. But uh, we're going to take that key. We're going to take this very specific string and append it to the end of it and compute the SHA-1 hash. That's going to give me a hex string. And I want to be careful not to handle this as a, a string since it's hex. I said hex string, didn't I? But since it's hex, um, the string, this string, or the same string with all the letters capitalized, those are the same values, these are hex values. So be careful not to handle this as a string. I'm going to go to this other site, and I just Google compute SHA-1 hash uh, and hex to base64 encoding. I'm going to take my hex, convert that to base64, I'm going to go back to Twitch, and that should be exactly that response, that accept response. So we have to do exactly those steps. Use exactly SHA-1, use that exact string appended to the end of the key, and base64 encode the result. If we're doing exactly that, which is what we'll have to do in the code, We have to do exactly that. Append this to the end of the key. Take the SHA-1 hash. However, you can compute SHA-1 in your language of choice. I think most languages have had that built in. Uh, Java slash Scala do. Uh, Python, I'm quite positive, does. JavaScript may be only to import a library, possibly. But for, to compute SHA-1, libraries are on the table. You can import whatever you need to be able to compute that. Don't compute your own SHA-1. Uh, and then base64 encode that thing. And that's your value that you're returning. So we got that exact response. And then once that connection was established, we can go to this messages tab. And we can see all the messages. Oh, this chat isn't very active. Oh, because because I'm, I'm not going to be a mature audience. Not during lecture. All right, so now that we have in a chat that we're in, go to chat. Then we can go to the Messages tab. We can actually see the messages as they come in, uh, in the format that Twitch chose to be able to send their messages. It's going to have username, their badges, uh, any information that they need for that specific chat message. The color of that user's name, their display name, and any extra information that, uh, that Twitch needs to be able to render that. Yeah, when, when uh, so we're responding with this except to compute this value, this is what we're going to need. Uh, need the process. Right. What's that? Uh, on the back. So the front end's going to generate a random key. Actually, I want to jump over to my server. I thought that the prompt also has to be in order to make sure that Oh, yeah, the, the, the front end would also have to do that. Yeah, so the front end's going to generate a random key, go through the same steps to 
to generate what the accept should be. And then when it gets the response, it's going to check, is that equal to what I expect? Yeah, so the client has to hash too, but that's happening inside that WebSocket uh, object. It's not something we have to worry about on the client side. Just, a, it, just because we're not doing that from scratch on the client. It's not, not somewhere where I want to take this course. We could also write a browser from scratch. That's, I just don't want. <laughs> I, I don't think that would be of educational value, uh, enough educational value to add, uh, to justify adding that to the course. Uh, uh, but we could, that is happening in the browser, that the browser is going through that, those same steps. Uh, we're just not implementing that. We're just offloading that to the WebSocket object. So if I go to this, so I changed my code just a tiny bit. All I did was create this WebSocket at the slash socket path. So I didn't add any functionality to my server. I just added that one line. I just want to take a look at the request that's made. This is all I have to do to make sure that I get a request. It's a get request at slash socket. Connection upgrade. Upgrade to WebSocket. and some random key. If I reload this page, this V-Y-J-I-A-F, I refresh the page, same tab, same everything, I'm going to get a completely different key. So it's randomly generated each time. So we do, we, we can't just remember what it is for a client or something. We do have to compute this with this key we have to run our WebSocket logic, take whatever key this is, extract that header, get that key, run through this logic, and then set that header to be able to verify to the client that we're implementing WebSockets. see all the, each chat message is a separate message. Let's see. Yeah, I don't think we're going to find anything in our city. Anybody have questions? Yes. How long does it look like it's stagnant and then it's going to be better than it? Potentially forever? I, I'm a little hesitant to say that, but it, until either side closes the connection, it's going to remain open. So once either side closes the connection, then, then it's all over. But I don't think there's any limit. I think it can stay open forever. So the if the computer dies, the browser will close those connections. Like if, if once, uh, once your computer dies, those TCP connections are destroyed, and the server is going to see that and then say, oh, the client disappeared. This is, uh, this is no good. I believe that's part of, I'm speculating a little bit here, but I believe there's something in the TCP protocol that's, that says, hey, I'm, I'm still here. Yeah, I, I believe so. I'm fuzzy on that part, so don't quote me on that one. Uh, but there's some way to know that that connection is still open. And there are things in the, the WebSocket protocol, we can actually see that uh, right here that we can implement. We can send these ping messages from the client and then send back the Kong from the server to say, hey, are, are we still good? Yeah, we're still good. This connection is still open. 
And if one of those pings doesn't get a response, the server, the client's going to reestablish that connection. So we can do things at the WebSocket level as well. But I believe TCP does some of that for us. Because I, if, uh, like if I just close this tab, shut it down gracefully, the, uh, the browser's going to sever that connection. And, the, uh, and we're going to get the on disconnect message on the server. If it crashes, we still get that message. I'm not exactly sure on the mechanics of how that happens, though. But we do, we can detect those disconnections. Anything else? All right, see everyone Wednesday. <laughs>